Hello, kidney warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is Dadvice TV. As a matter of fact, this is episode number, holy cow, 300. 300 videos to help you live better with kidney disease and live longer. Whoa, tons of great information here to help you, you know, deal with uh, the challenges of CKD. Now tonight, it is the beginning of the month, so we have your favorite renal dietitian here to answer your questions. So go ahead, type your questions in the comments right there on YouTube, and we'll see them go by, and we're gonna try to answer as many of them as we can over the next half an hour. All right, now, my guest, is a renal dietitian. Let me tell you, if you are new to kidney disease and you do not have a renal dietitian as part of your healthcare team, that is something I think everyone should have. You're not gonna be afraid of food. You're not gonna wonder, can I eat that? What should I eat? Because when you first get diagnosed, it feels like everything is bad for you, but it's not. And a renal dietitian can help you figure out how to eat not be afraid of food, and enjoy eating. All right, let's get to the good stuff. Please welcome from plantpoweredkidneys.com and the Plant Powered Kidneys amazing Facebook group, renal dietitian Jen Hernandez. Hey, Jen, how you doing? Hi, James. I'm great. Happy National Kidney Month and National Nutrition Month. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, I'm so thrilled. March is one of my favorite months for many reasons. For one, getting into the spring out of the dreary winter season, but probably more importantly, we're celebrating nutrition and kidney. The dietitians have decided to make all the stars align for renal dietitians so that March is our big month. And I'm super excited to be celebrating here with you all tonight and to be providing more nutrition information throughout the month of March and of course beyond, because if you follow us at Plant Powered Kidneys, you know that we're always giving out information, tips, and just general helpful ideas on how to navigate a renal diet. But if you're brand new here, if you've never met me, my name is Jen Hernandez. I am a renal dietitian. I am a registered dietitian that's also board certified in renal nutrition. And that's where I have spent the last wow, like 10 years of my dietitian career is helping kidney patients. I've worked with kidney patients through, from dialysis through transplant, all of the stages in between and helping everyone find a better way to eat to take care of not only their kidney health, but also their just overall health and well-being. And that's what I really enjoy doing every single day at Plant Powered Kidneys. So you can find more information on our website at plantpoweredkidneys.com. You can find us on Facebook in our Facebook group and on Instagram, as well as Pinterest. We have a ton of content out there for you. So be sure to follow along to learn more about kidney nutrition from a kidney nutrition expert. But I'm excited to get into our questions for today. Really thrilled to do this. Awesome. All right, let me bring this up here. And we have people saying hello from Canada. We got Sandy here, who's watching from Windsor, Ontario, which is about 35 minutes away from me. My wife, my kids and I were just there on Sunday, did some shopping, went to an amazing buffet um, in the Devonshire Mall. Huge Asian buffet with so much great food. Tastes delicious. Oh, just love it. We got a lot of other people saying hello. Now we got a question already. Let me bring it up here. It is from Den, who is in Toronto, Canada. For those of you out there, that's where they filmed Schitt's Creek. That's where the Rosebud Motel is. You can still drive by and see it, but you better see it soon because I hear they're going to tear it down. Um, yeah, funny show. Loved watching it. But, it but Den's question is, what's the best cereal in bread? And it sounds like he has IG nef nephropathy. Whew tongue twister for me and he's got some protein leakage yeah so 
breads and cereals. That is a common question that we get. And we do have two blog articles with a ton of information for both of those. So just so you know, I'm not going to be able to go through all of the information here today, but you can definitely check out our articles at plantpoweredkidneys.com to get a ton more information with specific recommendations. Now for, let's go into the cereals first, you know, first meal of the day, we're looking at breakfast. So some of the things that we look at for cereal, including being cautious with added sugars, because a lot of cereals, they can be quite high in added sugars. And a lot of times I seem to find some association, there's no research behind this, this is just my perspective, but a lot of the cereal boxes, like the more color that's on the box, the more sugar there is. <laughs> to see like i'm thinking of some of those really fruity colors and really fruity cereals they just seem to have a lot of added sugars so you want to be careful with how much sugar is added into your cereal so what we're looking at is no more than about 12 grams of sugar per cereal and you actually can find quite a few options that will be working here so you don't worry there are plenty that will be available for you just look under the added sugars not the total sugars but look under the added sugars of the cereal in the nutrition label and that's where you're going to kind of get a better idea another thing is speaking of the nutrition label make sure you look at the serving size because sometimes cereals like granola they'll only be like a quarter cup compared to maybe like a whole grain cereal that might be like one and one third cups. It could be kind of a weird serving size that they might be using to fit certain metrics so where they can say low in sugar or low in sodium or high in fiber. So make sure you look at the nutrition facts, make sure you look at that label for that serving size to know how much you're getting from these different nutrients. Another thing that you want to look at is try to aim for cereals that have whole grains. And the reason that we're doing this is because the whole grain comes with fiber and the fiber is going to help us feel satiated. It's going to help us feel full for a longer period of time. So that's going to be a really, really helpful thing to include in a cereal. If your cereal doesn't have a lot of fiber, and when I say a lot, I mean like three to five grams is actually a really good amount of fiber for a cereal. If it doesn't quite reach that amount, don't worry. An easy way to help correct that is to add fruit to your cereal. So you can add blueberries or raspberries that are high in fiber. Strawberries are a great option. Even some banana will also add fiber to your breakfast cereal. So don't be afraid to add something into your cereal to make it more nutritious and filling for you. So um, I do have some specific brand uh, ideas on our article on plantpoweredkidneys.com and we do have them separated by potassium levels because there may be a potassium concern. Now, not everybody needs to be worrying about potassium in their foods, including cereals, but if that is the case, we do have them listed in the lower and the higher potassium ranges. And there are still plenty of options on all spectrums of potassium that you can still include for CKD. Now, I know the question had addressed specifically IgA nephropathy and protein leakage. So protein leakage is a symptom of kidney disease. And I'm sure Dr. Rowe talks a lot about this from that medical standpoint, because it is more on the medical side of things. But even with IgA nephropathy, we can look at some dietary intervention in some dietary interventions like potentially gluten free, which gluten free cereals can often be lower in protein, and that can also be helpful for kidney patients. So if you do need to follow a lower protein diet, looking at some of the gluten free cereals and breads can be a helpful option for you. So I hope that kind of gives some uh, ideas as far as some cereals to look at or some nutrients specifically to be targeting. Because the other thing that I have a challenge with sometimes when I recommend specific brands is that not all of us have access to the same brand. We don't have all have access to the same exact cereals. And so looking, it's, it's that basically that concept of teaching how to fish rather than giving the fish, right? So I'm saying these are some things to look at for whatever cereals you can find. Don't forget about hot cereals too, like oatmeal and grits. Those can be a really great kidney friendly staple for your morning meal or for honestly any time of the day too. Awesome. All right. What is, and this is a question from Valsa. 
you want to, you know, some advice on how can you incorporate plant-based proteins? Great, right there. For someone who has IBS and food sensitivities. Anything with gut issues is going to be, I mean, besides CKD, gut issues are highly individualized and everybody can have their own experiences or symptoms with different foods. So what I would be looking at is one, working individually, working one-on-one with a dietitian who can help you maybe follow something like a low FODMAP diet that would target different types of carbohydrates to help analyze what's going on with your body and to see which ones that you can include and should include and which ones are going to be more triggering or hard for you, hard for your body to digest. Um, Another possibility is looking into digestive enzymes, and these are kind of more of a broad spectrum solution. It won't necessarily be helpful for everybody, and sometimes people will take them and they don't feel anything different because that might not be the exact cure, the, the, the help that they're looking for. So it's an idea, it's a possibility, but talk with your healthcare provider to see if that would be something that would be helpful. Also, talking with a gastroenterologist, a doctor that specializes in GI health, They might be able to do some additional testing with you to help better analyze what's going on with your gut. And there are dietitians that also specialize in gut health and can do things like a GI map that would look more at your gut health and help you better understand what is maybe being digested or not being digested. If you have a dysbiosis, which is basically an imbalance of your microbiome, an imbalance of those healthy and not so healthy bacteria in your gut, they can look at things like that for you as well. So working with a dietitian that specializes in that area can be great. I have definitely uh, collaborated with GI dietitians and other dietitians in other fields, providing a renal perspective into some patients as well. So, um, you know, dietitians, we are very collaborative with each other. So when you're working with a dietitian, they might be actually working with other dietitians to help your case as well, which can be really great. Perfect. Very helpful. All right. Debbie asks, are there any good lunch ideas you could recommend as lunch seems to get ignored? And it looks like she's on a 65 grams of protein a day target for her diet. So 65 grams of protein is a pretty good amount to be working with. If we think about dividing that into like three meals and a, and a, a light protein snack, it's about 20 grams of protein per day or per, sorry, per meal. And when we're looking at that, we can think of things like beans and quinoa. We can look at brown rice. We can look at edamame, a lot of different legumes uh, that can be incorporated into something like a bean salad. Uh, a client I was just talking with earlier today, one of her go-tos, she makes this Southwestern bean slaw using beans and cabbage and puts that all together and then has it prepared for her week. So she's got her lunches made for the week. So. I think anything for for a lunchtime meal can be prepared ahead of time, Um, even from like dinner leftovers. That's obviously a really easy win when you can just have something the night before and have it ready for your next day. Another thing you can look at is sandwiches and the classic peanut butter and jelly or nut butter and jelly. That peanut butter is providing protein as well as the bread. So also kind of touching back to that first question, which I didn't dive too much into, but don't worry, there's an article about all about that. Um, The, let's say Ezekiel bread. I know that's a really common one, a really popular one, the low sodium Ezekiel bread. Just one slice of that provides five grams of protein. So if you're making a sandwich right there, you're getting 10 grams of protein from the bread alone. And then adding a few tablespoons of peanut butter is going to provide you with another seven or so grams of protein. So just that sandwich is coming close to 20 grams right there. So while we do think sometimes that meals may seem like they can be overwhelming, sometimes our simplest meals can actually be much more nutritious than we realize, which actually reminds me about my upcoming class, which I haven't announced publicly yet. And I think Mm -hmm. this is a really good time to announce it. Perfect (laughs) time. 
So I'm actually in honor of National Nutrition Month and something that I have been really thinking about for a long time. I'm going to be hosting a live masterclass about how to use chronometer in better understanding kidney nutrition. And so I've already emailed James the link and he's going to get that up for you all to register. I haven't told anybody outside of my class and my students yet about this. But this is going to be a great opportunity where I will actually show you using chronometer and giving examples of some easy recipes, some really easy meals to show you how everything adds up. And a peanut butter jelly sandwich sounds like a great way to show how easy everything can add up. And that's what made me think about it was how it can come up to 20 grams of protein right there. So if you're interested in enrolling, it's going to be a live class on Wednesday, March 20th at 12 p.m. Eastern. So we'll get the links out. I will be sharing them on Instagram and Facebook later. And also if you get our emails, I'll be putting out some announcements there as well. But I figured, hey, we're talking about nutrition. We're talking about how to look at nutrients. Now's a great time to bring it up. <laughs> yeah, and that's my favorite apps, one I use. I, you know, every so often the scroller down below, it'll say, hey, here's the food tracking app that I use. The link takes you right to a page about it. Mm -hmm. um, it is fantastic. There's a free version. There's also a version you can pay that gives you more features and gives you a web page which you could share with your doctor, or your dietitian, so they can log in and see everything you've been eating and how you're doing. And maybe they'll notice something before your next visit and shoot you an email or something. Help keep you right on track. All right. Our next question. Now, this is a more of a general question, but I'd love to get this out there. Because I have a feeling this is someone who's new to kidney disease. And when you're newly diagnosed, it looks like everything is bad for you. And everything is off of the menu when it comes to eating. But as we've learned, that's not true. Maria asks, what foods are good for CKD? Oh, my gosh. Well, Maria, you were in luck because you have quite a lot of options when it comes to the new renal diet and i say new because in the past couple of years there have been updates into renal nutrition guidelines so us dietitians and doctors some doctors that are in the nutrition world have been getting more education and updates based on the research that we have seen with the renal diet now the reason a question like this comes up, like what can I eat with kidney disease is because historically there has been so many don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat this, don't eat that. There's been so many foods to avoid that that's why people are saying, well, then what can I eat? Because we've always thought there's just nothing around. But now, and people in our Facebook group probably are so tired of hearing this, but eating according to your labs, that's really the key. So for example, Potassium is a really big concern. And for a lot of patients, a lot of clients, we are looking at their potassium in their labs and setting goals or metrics for how much potassium they should be aiming for in the day. Because the new guidelines are saying we need to be going off of the labs. And just because someone has chronic kidney disease does not mean that they should be following a low potassium diet. In fact, most people don't get enough potassium to begin with. And so many of my clients, you'd be surprised how many I have to actually challenge to eat more potassium in their day so that they can have better blood pressure control, better heart health, cardiovascular health, and protect their kidneys by getting more of this very important nutrient. So many cases eating more potassium, which opens a lot of doors as far as foods that you can eat, a lot of fruits and vegetables and whole grains, that is a great opportunity. Now, if you are told directly from your healthcare provider that you need to be on a low potassium diet, that is definitely important for you to discuss. So things that I recommend that people should be talking about in this case is, okay, how much potassium, if, if a doctor is telling you to follow a low potassium diet, how much potassium should I be eating a day? Let them give you that metric. If they don't know, which they might not know because they're not dietitians, they're not nutrition experts, that's okay. They have a ton on their plate. Nephrologists have a lot to be focusing on. 
but that's where dietitians come in. So you can ask for a referral to a dietitian, especially if they're telling you to follow a low potassium diet, and then start looking at that target. And the goal is not to eat as little potassium as possible. It's to hit the right amount of potassium. So that is really, really important to be getting enough potassium in your body to take care of your health because potassium still is incredibly important. The challenge is more, is more so about what the kidneys are able to take care of and you don't wanna overload them with too much potassium, but you still want them to have some potassium. So back to the original question, what can I eat with chronic kidney disease? There's, it's basically anything you want with the exception of star fruit, which has a toxin that the kidneys can't take care of with CKD. And in some cases, licorice can have an impact on potassium and blood pressure. So I'm not often, I'm not often okaying black licorice or natural licorice. Um, and that's something I do have to bring up because a lot of like teas will actually include licorice in them. A lot of supplements will include licorice in them. So it's maybe not necessarily that you like licorice or that you'll have the candy, but if you're taking something, just make sure you check the label to look for any additives that could be harmful. Yep. And to me, the question, I, in the beginning, my question was, what can I eat? And I would ask a lot, can I eat X? Can I mm -hmm. eat Y? And the real question that I should have been asking, which took a while, but my dietitian helped me kind of reprogram my brain is, how much mm -hmm. of X can I eat? How much of Y can I eat? Because some things are high in sodium. I got to mm -hmm. eat a lot less of those. I can still include them in my diet. If it's high in phosphorus and I need to watch my phosphorus, I can eat less of it than I normally would if I didn't have to worry about that. So once I realized or once I learned that it's how much it's portion control, that was the secret for mm -hmm. me to the renal diet. <laughs> it made the world so much better for me. I mean, I would not eat a Big Mac. There's just so much bad stuff in there. But if I was craving so bad a Big Mac, I could have some. I can't eat a whole one, um, but I could fit maybe a quarter. I, it's hard to fit a half of a Big Mac into a, a healthy diet because there's just so much bad stuff in there. But I could fit that in there, track it in my app, all those stuff that's in there, and eat a lighter other meal to kind of balance it all out for the day. So I loved learning that it's how much, mm -hmm. not what. And we have Yvonne asked a few, can I eat sauerkraut? Can I eat ice cookies? Can I eat brand cereal? And that mm -hmm. all falls into that, you know, look at your labs, work mm -hmm. with your dietitian. That'll help you understand how much room you have in your diet and portion control mm -hmm. with these types of things. Any comments you want to give her on that? Yeah, I, so I had this basically a very similar conversation with a client today and she had a list of foods and we were going through and can I have this? Can I have this? Can I have this? And my answer every time was yes, 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 yes. And we basically talked more about the nutrients and a lot of times I would put back the question of, well, what about this food is a concern for you? Because a lot of times what we hear from, from clients and students is, oh, well, I was told that, you know, bran is high in phosphorus and so we can't have it. That's an old renal diet concept. And what we know now is that the phosphorus that comes from whole grains, it is not well absorbed by us, by humans. We do not have the enzyme to break it down. So we only actually get 30 to 50% of the phosphorus that comes from whole grains. So even if it says it has phosphorus in it, it's not going to be the thing that makes a big impact on our phosphorus levels. So again, we were uh, talking in the session with the, each of these individual items and addressing the, what the actual concern was, not the food, because the food isn't the concern, it's the nutrient. Like what about this food is a concern for you? And that's where we were talking and doing some more education on how to include things. And we were using chronometer and I was giving some meal examples and showing like, okay, this is something that you can include and let's include some of these other nutrients, some of these other foods to help with that concern. Um, and so it, it was a great teaching tool for us to be able to look at these things and understand how they kind of fit into a full day because 
any of these foods, the, the brand, the ice cookies, these are not going to be, you're not going on a diet of all iced cookies. You're not going on an all diet of all brand. It's a function, it's a, it's a fraction of your day. And there is no one food, there is no one meal that will make or break your kidney health. It's all about the overall picture, the big picture, the patterns and habits that you set up. That's what is what can help support your kidney health. Yep. All right. Brenda asked a great question. She wants to know, does your diet need to change in any way when you reach stage five without this pre-dialysis? So we do, of course, of course we do. We have an article all about stage five at Plant Powered Kidneys. So feel free to check that out because it is a very, very, it's basically a book. Um, it's a very intense uh, article, but some of the things that I would be looking at for a stage five client is for one, definitely the protein, making sure that we're not getting too much protein. Patients that are in stage four and stage five are typically on a lower protein diet. But the challenge with this is that you don't want to go too low in protein that you become malnourished because your body still does need protein. Again, just like it needs potassium and needs these nutrients, but the problem is the kidney can only handle so much. So your body still needs the protein, but the question is how much. In some cases, adding in the medical food known as keto analogs, um, we have an article about that, don't worry. <laughs> We have that information, but keto analogs can also be used alongside a low protein diet. But this is something that does factor into your total protein consumption. So it's really, really important to have an assessment with the dietitian to make sure you are appropriate for keto analogs because not everybody with chronic kidney disease, even in stage four or stage five, would be appropriate to have a low protein diet with keto analogs. Uh, for example, if there's diabetes also in the mix, that's another consideration. And maybe not as low of a protein diet would be appropriate because of this other condition that's going on that we need to be mindful for. Or if the person is not able to follow a low protein diet and they're getting too much protein, which I know a lot of people have been commenting about how hard it is to reach enough protein, but it's very hard to stick to. When I say low protein, sometimes I've had clients that are on 20 grams of protein for a day. You'd be surprised how fast that adds up. So you want to make sure that you're getting the right amount of protein along with the keto analogs and having your dietitian and your doctor following you to make sure that you do have everything covered, all of your bases taken care of, and you're not creating problems in other areas just by lowering the protein. So that would be one thing I'd be looking at. Another thing would be assessing potassium, making sure you're getting the right amount, because in those lower stages, that is definitely a risk of having too much potassium in the blood. So you want to make sure you're getting the right amount there, looking at labs, looking at the diet, seeing what's going on there. Very, very important. Um, phosphorus would always be a conversation. There's, I could go on and on, um, so I'll leave it to the article, but those are the first three things that come to mind for stage five in particular. All right, we are almost out of time, but there's two more questions I want to get to. Um, this half hour goes by really quick. Okay. And for everyone out there, Jen and I have been doing this for so many years, and her site, plantpoweredkidneys.com, is loaded with so many articles. You can search and find them. Um, everything we talked about in the past, we do entire episodes about milk or something like that. She has an article to support it. So it's mm -hmm. definitely a fantastic resource to go in there and look for additional information or if you have a question we weren't able to get to. All right, Shy BB Girl is from Tokyo. Hey there, pretty far away. Her husband is CKD stage four. So his kidneys aren't failing yet. He's got stage four and she's curious because he loves curry powder. Is that something he should avoid or is it okay to have that in his diet? Curry powder is a fantastic spice, and the fact that it's providing so much flavor without salt, I love it. I think it's a great spice to have on hand, and curry itself is a great way to get a lot of vegetables into the diet, as well as some protein. So you can throw tofu in there, you can put in some edamame. If you're doing some animal protein, of course, you know, chicken and shrimp can work as well. 
even some fish. And then you serve it with your white rice because curry, let's be honest, curry goes best with white rice. And yes, white rice is totally okay to have in a renal diet, just as is brown rice. You could do a mix of them as well, but I love curry. And you can add more calories into this by using that canned coconut milk, which helps give it more satiety. It helps us feel more full because just the curry powder itself onto vegetables, it's not gonna give a lot of calories. And we do need to get plenty of calories in so that our body has the energy it needs to take care of us and to allow our kidneys and all, our, all of our organs to continue to work very well. So big thumbs up to curry powder. Very good. And your answer works right into this next question. This will be our last one for tonight. It's from Yvonne. What if someone is malnourished? Does that impact their kidneys? Absolutely it can. Being malnourished is a state of stress. That is a state where your body is not happy. It is in trouble and it needs help. And that's when we say it's really important to work with the dietitian and work with your healthcare team to address these different areas because being malnourished, having not enough nutrients, whether that's calories, it's not getting in the right amount of protein. I've very often seen people not get enough carbohydrates or healthy fats in their diet. This can all be problematic to our overall health. And many times kidney patients actually need more calories than they realize. This comes from <laughs> fighting years of diet culture where we all thought we had to be on 1200 calories a day because that was the magic diet number, but that is not enough calories for an adult. We need to have more. Now calories are individualized and they are based on many factors, including our size, including our age, our health conditions, our activity level, there's a lot of factors involved. So that's why it's important to work one-on-one -on -one with the dietitian because you do want to get that personal interaction and they'll be able to give you a personalized nutrition prescription that outlays all of these things for you. So the malnourishment is definitely something to be focused on and we can help as dietitians by addressing food, making sure you're eating enough and then potentially adding in some helpful supplements, but we definitely don't do the supplements first. We do the food first and make sure that you're getting enough food in your day for your body and your health. And then the supplements are like the cherry on top, just like that extra oomph that helps support your health. Perfect. And that brings us to the end of our time together for this month, but we will be back again next month. Now I have another show coming up on the 14th, which is World kidney day we're going to do a hangout here i'll be here we may have some guests pop on and we're just going to chit chat ask your questions you can talk about ckd my experience with it what i did wrong what i did right whatever you got we're going to be here or i'll be here we can hang out talk ckd help spread the knowledge because the more you know about it the better it is the easier it is to be proactive in managing your disease and I've got another um, video coming up this month. We're still nailing down the date with someone who has an amazing story, um, what he went through and how he kind of decided, you know what, I'm not going to let kidney disease hold me down, started exploring the world, visiting and other country stuff. Oh, that's coming up. Um, so keep an eye out for that to be posted to the Facebook channel. Jen, thank you so much. And again, we'll remind everyone, plantpowerkidneys.com. The link is down below in the description. Make sure and join the Facebook group. Great recipe ideas, meal ideas, tips from other people. It's very positive and supportive, which makes it a wonderful, wonderful Facebook group. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And I will see you all in the next video. Bye, everyone.